Okay, we're going live in a couple of seconds here. So we should just be silent on the screen. Let me mute all the attendants. Can everybody still hear me though? Yes, okay. So um, I am going to Welcome everyone here. Let me just change our view. Hello everyone and welcome uh, to Expand Your Horizons. We are very grateful to have you here. This is going to be a great conversation. I'm just going to hand it over to Sister Cynthia who can tell us more. Sister Cynthia, can you hear me? Yes. I am ready to go. It's seven o'clock. If we have everybody here and we're ready to start with introductions, I think that we can get started. Welcome to Expand Your Horizons, an outreach education ministry of the Notre Dame Sisters. Our February topic is Honest Talk, Effective Action. Honest talk can lead to a lot of common ground and understanding of systems of oppression, injustice, and mass incarceration. But effective action takes community leaders, for example, community leaders and police working as partners for public safety, businessmen, businesswomen, and economic development, and communities working with one another and engaging for the betterment of their people. Last October on Indigenous Peoples Day, our event was on understanding white silence. Pastor Lyndon Meyer and Ajmal Biden, leaders in our Notre Omaha community, um, gave us an understanding of white silence, but we were there for only an hour. So Ajmal kept saying, we need to have time to talk. And that led to what we are doing this evening. Preston Love is a leader in the community and he has a small book called A Clear Vision. On page 20, he says, a vaccine for coronavirus is in the process. The vaccine for racism is not. Our Omaha community needs to listen, learn and respond to people of color going forward. And we can begin this conversation by acknowledging our Native American heritage and who was here before the Europeans came. In Nebraska, there are six tribes on reservations. Also in Nebraska, there were slaves. At one point I read something about 50, but they were slaves. The first free black settler arrived in the city of Omaha in 1854 the year the city was incorporated. In 1861, the legislature had to override the governor's veto to abolish slavery. And we gained uh, six years later, Nebraska gained statehood. White silence was very much a part of what was happening for the Europeans. They were busy settling and not necessarily respecting the indigenous and the uh, slave environment and the economy that was existing in these colonies and the country that was developing. In February, 2018, Senator Justin Wayne came to our program and gave us a lot to listen to. In December, I watched the program, Speaking of Nebraska, when Senator Wayne and Senator Tom Brewer discussed how they are working together for the indigenous and the black peoples in Nebraska. They are responding with legislation. Just as the legislation back in the days of abolishing slavery, it took the legislation to move it forward. Senator Wayne sent us three of his priority bills. He's also working on several committees and has many involvements in our city and across the state. One of the effective actions in our state was um, 
the incorporation in August 1986 of the Nebraska Indian Health, uh, uh, Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition. In the December 2020 Speaking of Nebraska, Senator Brewer described the issues faced by Native American youth moving to urban areas. So this is a very important action in our state to have this agency. For the black community, the churches were very important. And in 1865, the um, St. John's AME Church began. The beloved community was formed with many other smaller congregations. In 1913, Claire Memorial United Methodist Church continued the ministry of faith and helping people to live in this uh, city of Omaha. Education systems are important and the Catholic Archdiocese looked at what was happening and they developed the Q's school system and in the, I would say south of Dodge Street here in Omaha, there was another action of bringing several parishes together to form the Catholic Schools Consortium. Public schools are also doing many different things and so the legislation that happens in the unicameral is going to bring things forward and we need to be aware of them. We welcome back Dr. Reverend Dr. Cynthia Ramirez Lindenmeyer. She was our facilitator in October and now she will be leading our uh, discussions and sharing this evening. She is pastor at Sacred Activism Community. She is a chaplain for the American Public University System. So let us listen, learn, and figure out how we will be responding. Well, thank you, Sister Cynthia. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for joining us tonight from wherever you are. It's, uh, it's been a rough week for many. And tonight we will talk about uh, the legislation in specifically in Nebraska that has affected so many. And I'm thankful that Senator Justin Wayne is our keynote speaker. He has been fighting for equity, for legislation to really overturn laws here in Nebraska that have been so dismantling to uh, equality for many. And as Sister Cynthia showed you the slides for Swanee, for Donna Polk and Portia Cavett, their involvement in community has tremendous impact and brings hope in many ways. And so tonight, what will happen is we'll hear from Senator Wayne and while he's talking, feel free to write any questions that you have in the comment section in Facebook and we will do our best to get those questions to him for him to answer. And then after he speaks a little bit, we'll be joined by our three panelists who will talk about what they are working in and how you can be involved in their particular areas of uh, collaborative community activism. And then we'll come back together and just kind of have a little talk with everyone. And again, this is an interactive event to help us all feel like we matter, that we are included and we are engaged. So. With that, uh, I introduce Senator Wayne from the Unicameral District 13 in Omaha. And thank you, Senator Wayne, for being here uh, since you've had a very hectic day already. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, uh, Sister Notre Dame, for having me. Um, it's always a fun to talk to you. I do miss the in person. Uh, off of State Street, it's always more fun to kind of interact. And when you say something and they look at you like, ah, I don't know about that. And then you get to go into more detail and explain, you don't have that feedback. So it's kind of, it's always interesting to do live conversations like this because you don't get the instant feedback that you normally would. Um, so a little bit about who I am. I grew up in District 13 my entire life. Um, I left only for a couple of years to go to University of Kansas. And then I, I came back and went to Creighton and Creighton Law School. And I've always been inspired by those who are dedicated to the community. Uh, actually, my first church was off of 55th and Ames. So uh, I was where I, so I've always been around this community. Uh, but since I've been down in, in Lincoln, the one thing that I ran on and the kind of thing that I'm focused on is if uh, I just truly believe if people have good paying jobs, many of our social issues, not all, many of our social issues and burdens that we have socially will go away or at least be significantly reduced. Part of it is if you have extra income, you can take your family out to a movie uh, you, that's de-stressful, that's 
things you can do to increase the quality of your life. And if you have a good paying job, you get up and you go to work every day, you have some pride and it builds a schedule. So you might not be out late at night because you know you have to be up at seven o'clock in the morning on that good paying job. So there's just a lot of what I would say social benefits around a good paying job. So I focused a lot on economics. Uh, but what's interesting in Nebraska is we can't use race when we talk about target initiative at the state level or any public uh, institution. So you have to get creative around how to define uh, resources to make sure you target those who are often left behind or intentionally left behind um, by our government. And so one of the unlucky and lucky benefits of being so segregated in Omaha is if you pick North Omaha census tracts and you pick poverty rates, you undoubtedly end up with mainly African Americans. That has changed over the last 20 years slightly, but for the most part, it still is targeting those who were often left behind intentionally out of, out of the process of economic development. So the three bills that we're kind of talking about today um, are a couple different bills, but one of them is, the here. I had a hearing today on the Urban Redevelopment Act, LB 544. And what this bill essentially does is create a tax incentive program for small businesses in our area. So last year uh, with the Imagine Act, we, we passed a bill in Lincoln to allow big corporations mainly, but any corporation, but mainly qualifies for big corporations to get tax incentives. So we have a lot of construction around like Facebook had put their servers here, Google are adding servers, Kiwit International Headquarters are here. And how we keep companies like Union Pacific and those companies here is often through tax incentives. Whether we uh, agree with that or not, that's a bigger discussion we can have, but that's the reality of what we have in Nebraska and actually around the country. So after we did that, um, we left out, well, I, I added to the legislation what we call economic redevelopment areas, but I didn't put no meat behind it because I didn't want to fight it on the floor last year. Uh, it's going to be step processes to get this done. And what those economic redevelopment areas are is 150% the average rate of unemployment in census tracts plus 20% poverty. So I'm really targeting the states and particularly Omaha, uh, this, the areas that need it the most. We're talking high unemployment and we're talking a, a good percentage of poverty with resources. So this year I, I introduced the bill LB 544 Urban Re Redevelopment Act to focus on these areas called economic redevelopment areas and what we're going to do is target eight million dollars and if you're from Omaha or, you, or you've been to Omaha and what I did with the committee today is I had pictures from Google Maps of 30th Street, 16th Street, actually Ames from 55th to 66th and uh, 30th Street, 24th Street, 16th Street from Ames to Cummings and what they were surprised at is the number of empty lots and the reason that's surprising is because if you're talking about development and tax credits, one of those lots, you can build commercial space for maybe 200,000, but you don't qualify for any tax incentives to do so right now. Underneath my bill, we would encourage that tax incentives for those developments of them smaller lots. So it doesn't have to be a 10 million, $20 million project promising 200 jobs. It could be as small as a $100,000 project that doesn't promise any job or it promises five. And if you get five jobs, the tax incentives go up. And so what we're trying to concentrate on is really concentrate on these jobs. And what that does is, and, and what I'm arguing is, I don't care what the job is, as long as it's paying 70% of the medium wage, which is above minimum wage, uh, I'll take a coffee shop, I'll take uh, a t-shirt company, I'll take restaurants, but we want to encourage businesses to develop in an area that was left behind. And that's, that's where that bill comes from. Um, it's been uh, three years in the making uh, because it's very hard. And what's interesting about the state of Nebraska statistically, and I'll move to my next bill real quick, is the stats in Nebraska when it comes to affordability, we're number six in the country. When it comes to economic opportunity, we're 18th in the country. But when it comes to equality in those other two categories, we're 48th in the country. We are significantly making sure and closing the doors intentionally for those who wanna move up to the middle class but can't because of the lack of opportunities, which ironically brings me to my next bill, which is called the hub bill. And this will actually have a hearing uh, next week in government, and it's called the historically underutilized businesses. 
And part of what we're trying to do underneath that bill is we are trying to encourage the state, require the state to look at these hub zones or actually economic uh, redevelopment areas that I just talked about, 150% of the average poverty, I mean, the average unemployment and 20% poverty area and use these companies that are there to make sure that they are actually getting government contracts. And people don't realize, but we are a $4 billion state when it comes to our, what goes through our budget every two years. So $2 billion a year, we contract out over a billion six a year uh, in government contracts. And if you look at the city of Omaha, at least the last 10 years, we did over $3 billion worth of projects. And that's from the sewer separation. That's from Ames Street. It seems like it gets redone every two years. Um, just multiple projects that quite honestly, folks from North and South Omaha, black and brown folks are, are left out of. So that bill will, will require the state to set goals of a minimum of 10% and try to find small businesses. And yes, it'll cost a little bit of money on the state, but I call that doing good business. If we can lift everybody up and make sure everybody has a chance to participate in government contracts. Again, we're talking about growing the economy, talking about making sure people have good paying jobs. And we're talking about making sure people can survive uh, in an environment. We're gonna contract it out anyway. So why should somebody from Kansas City come up here and we got small businesses here that can do the work? So that's what the hub bill is about is it's really simple. It's just government. Why don't we just do good business with the folks who are paying you to run the, run the state anyway? Kind of simple. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> the last bill is LB 548 uh, that was mentioned um, what I was gonna talk about. And this one is a, 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 I can't call it a bill. It is a bill because I'm trying to pass a statute, but it won't pass this year. And the reason it won't pass this year and it's called the Nebraska Racial Justice Act. Um, Cause it's more of a conversation because I'm not sure how to, just like with the uh, hub, zone, hub bill, it, it takes two or three years to figure out how to not have unintended consequences and make sure it works the way it's supposed to. But what this bill basically does is right now, if you are sitting in prison, and this is mainly for the people who were convicted in 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe early 90s, you can't use racial data to file a motion for a new trial. And what, what I mean by that is we know 60s and 70s, people were getting life sentences without parole. And if you were African American or Latino or Native American, you had a tougher sentence than if you were white. Those are facts. And so what this bill is trying to say that we're not gonna excuse your crime. We just, want, we just wanna go back and look and use data from those times to say, ah, maybe that sentence was a little too hard. Doesn't mean that you're even gonna uh, be acquitted or anything like that, because that's not what we're doing. We're not excusing the crime. We're just saying you have a motion to set aside or reduce your conviction uh, based off of racial data. And so, um, Here's one interesting stat that that shocks me, and I, I'm, I'm going to click on something to make sure I get the right number right, because every time I say it, I just can't believe it. Folks who got uh, life with parole, the average sentence of Black people in Douglas County is 56 years. For life with parole for white people are 14 years. In Lancaster County, whites were given the lowest years on average, even lower than 20. However, Blacks were given three times life sentences for many of the same crimes. Now, I can't say that the juror or the judge was racist, but I think we can't ignore the times of the 60s, 70s, and 80s in which people are clearly serving out life sentences, but other folks weren't. And so, like I said, it's not a bill that, because there's so much I got a technica technical stuff I have to work on to make sure it's done correctly. What I don't want is to open the floodgates and just let everybody start a applying for motion for uh, reduced sentences, things like that. But we can't ignore what the data is. And the fact of the matter is, is the data is there. That if you had life with parole or without parole, you're almost six times more higher to be sentenced for a longer sentence. I just can't believe it's just because of the crimes. Because oftentimes the crimes were identical when you look at the data. So the only factor, differing factor was race. And we're also talking about times during recent heights that are heightened racial tensions in the 60s and 70s, especially when you look around Douglas County when we had race riots in 1968 and, and 1966. So 
though that that bill is trying to start that conversation that this group continues to try to have them same dialogues to say how do we take that from a dialogue to action how do we how do we give a judge who can look at another judge sentence and say yeah you know i'm looking at all these other cases in front of us everybody else got 14 years and you got 56 for the same crime i'm not 100% sure race is the answer but that just doesn't seem fair and so we're trying to open that door back up to have that fairness conversation. We are not trying to excuse the crime because clearly they were convicted, but at least let them be sentenced on an equal playing field. And that and that's that's the big three. I can talk more, um, but um, I can keep going on and on. But I think I want to hear more about the, the policy conversations that are going on with the panel. But I did want to highlight those three uh, three big bills. And, and the reason they're important and quite honestly why they're all connected is every community in Nebraska should have a strong neighborhood school, opportunities for great for a great paying job, access to healthy foods, and safe streets. And so economic development, jobs, education, housing, transportation, and public safety, they're all connected. And if you can have a good paying job in your community with a good school, you'll be surprised how fast things change. And so that's kind of the basis of where I'm coming from and how all those these bills deal with different things, they're all connected. Um, they're all connected in the same thing for proving North Omaha and proving the overall dynamics of Nebraska. So I appreciate you uh, giving me time. Uh, I know I can keep going. I think there's some more time for me to talk, but I'm good and I appreciate it. No, thank you. We, we've had a couple of questions come in uh, one of them talked about, you were talking about uh, the the parole board. It seems like in Nebraska, the parole board meets maybe once or twice a year. In other states, they sometimes meet once or twice a month. Uh, that, I think, falls under the Secretary of State. Does LB 548 address that? Like how to oh. kind of get the parole board to meet a little bit more? This kind of goes around the parole board and allows you to file a motion back to a judge so it can be faster and be faster heard. Uh, the, the issue with the parole board, and this is a constitutional issue. We have a, we have a lot of interesting things in our state constitution. Uh, if you ever really want to read it, we, uh, we put a lot. We have a right to hunt and fish uh, in our constitution. Uh, most states have concepts, we, we have a lot of particulars. Um, but the issue constitutionally is the, the, the pardons board and the parole board, they're all kind of underneath the executive branch. And so um, it's all falls on the governor's shoulders. And we can pound over here as much as we want, but they don't have to do it. And that's kind of where we're trying to, we're all struggling with this idea of, of that. I think last year, the parole board and the pardons board, believe it or not, the pardons board, I think only met twice. Um, the parole board, I think, met three times, maybe four, but that just doesn't make sense. Um, no. <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all, but we can go on about that for a long time, but that's our kind of end run around it is to try to say, look, there clearly is some unfair sentencing. Let's put it back in the judge's hands to file a motion and we'll, we can go from there. Okay. I Thank you. It, that <laughs> sounds like something that we in the community can also be very active and vocal about. Another question came in <clears throat> is, what is the most common mistake, misconception they should think about on the bench, the, they being the judges? So I have to believe we, we don't want judges to be elected. Um, we don't want them running on tougher crime uh, or leading in on crime. But I have to believe part of the problem is the retention vote. I think people are worried uh, if they're not tough on crime um, that they might be voted out, even though it's hardly ever happened. And I don't think there's enough conversation about the dynamics of which somebody comes from. Uh, I think when you hear gun and you hear gang affiliation, you think we got we got to lock this kid up, we got we got to lock somebody up. But the secret is, is most of my high school, if not through law school, I was in the gang file. And what people don't know about Omaha is, and how our gang file works is, if you get stopped in the car, and there's a known or a gang associate, whether you're one or not, they're just in the car with you. 
um, they run everybody's names and they link you to that gang. And so there's different tiers of, you know, gang activity or an affiliate and, and you have to have so many non contacts with gangs to get off that, that list. Well, I got put on the gang file because I was at my grandmother's uh, house on Thanksgiving and it might've been sixth grade, um, seventh grade. And we went to the store with my cousins and they stopped the car and that's how I got on. Um, and that happens a lot in our community. Um, so I think the idea of gangs and guns, and I think from a judge's perspective, um, there's not a lot of diversity of thought. Uh, we don't have a very diverse bench, uh, which there's two judges openings coming up. Um, we just don't have a lot of diversity of thought. And so I think it's easy to get stuck in the mode of uh, tough on crime and, and you get jaded. I mean, let's just be honest. If every day you're seeing people walk in committing crimes, it's hard not to. Um, so judges are human. And that's why I think it's important for attorneys to make sure they see a human, not just a, a, a number for or somebody in a suit. No, oh, thank you for that. Cause I, I remember, um, I think it was like last year, Colson Whitehead, he wrote a book, a fictional book, but based on actual events called the Nickel Boys. And that same exact scenario happened where a young man promising career uh, just happened to be in a car with a gang member and his whole life went on this trajectory that uh, was very tragic. So we have one more question before we turn over to the panelists. And it's in December on speaking of Nebraska, you gave a specific example of structural racism in contrast to two other adjectives I hear, systemic racism and institutional racism. And they just said, seems legislation would fall under the notion of structural uh, racism. Would that be systemic, institutional, or? Yeah, so these words get thrown around kind of like implicit bias and diversity and, uh, I don't do very well with labels. Um, so sometimes I confuse them myself. What, what we can't ever legislate morals or what's in people's hearts. Mm. And to me, that's more of a systematic thing or a systemic thing where um, it's just what people call the implicit bias. What we can legislate is the instruction, is the institutional and the, okay, you can't do this. This, this is wrong or, um, like hub, you need to contract with more small businesses from North and South Omaha. Like that's institutional change. But even then, right, you can't change how a general contractor or the state is going to work with you. That's that hidden systematic culture, systemic area that oftentimes get blurred together. And that's kind of what this racial uh, justice act is trying to blend and that's why i said i, I can't really push to to get the bill done because it's it's so complex you're mixing structural with with this feeling of systemic things and it's it's really hard to make that all work it's going to be a, probably a couple year process to figure out how to do it and that's a perfect lead-in uh for our panelists and for those joining us uh, Senator Wayne will come back. We have three panelists and the first panelist, uh, what Senator Wayne said, I'm going to go back. It's a great quote. You can't legislate what's in people's hearts. And uh, our first panelist, uh, each one's going to introduce themselves and talk for about five minutes, is really one who speaks to what is in people's hearts. And that would, um, is Pastor Portia Cavett. And so Portia, I'll just ask you to introduce yourself and talk about really what's on your heart and how you've been involved in the community. Uh, thank you, um, Reverend Dr. Cynthia and uh, Senator Wayne. Thank you so much for taking time out to share with us and break down your priority bills. I'm Reverend Portia Cabot, pastor of Clare Memorial United Methodist Church at 55th and Ames. Uh, the church has been in the community for 107 years. This year, we will celebrate 108 years. We've been in four uh, locations here in uh, North Omaha and just happen to be up on the hill at 55th and Ames right now. 
I also have the pleasure of serving as the first uh, female elected president of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance. I am truly thankful for my colleagues uh, for electing me uh, in March. I started uh, my term in the pandemic and uh, we are still working together to do things. The church has been an integral part of the community and especially the black church is where people went uh, for hope, where people went uh, to uh, receive the encouragement that they needed in order to make it uh, in the society in which we live. And we know that uh, people of African descent or African Americans, people of color have always uh, been uh, put aside or left out. And so here uh, in my 12 years, I think I've been at Claire now 12 years, I'm starting my 13th year as pastor since 2008. And my focus has been on education. We have to uh, start early and deal with our children and help them uh, to realize and to dream uh, what they want to be and who they want to be. So we definitely have to have good schools uh, in our neighborhood so that kids can go uh, to the school around the house and uh, be able to develop friendships and relationships along the way. I'm also very much concerned uh, for the health and well-being of people, uh, not only physically, but emotionally, uh, spiritually, um, economically. And so as I look at the health uh, issues and especially the health disparities in the African-American community, I have uh, the pleasure of chairing the North Omaha Area Health Board, the NOAA Free Clinic, which is right across the street from my church at 56. Uh, 20 Ames Avenue. I am the past president of the North Omaha Community Care Council, where uh, we meet to address the needs of those in North Omaha. And there are other organizations that come together because we have to work collaboratively uh, to bring about a change. And then um, for food insecurity, uh, for the last two years, I've realized that that has been uh, brought to the forefront, and especially during, uh, in the midst of COVID. Uh, Claire has a 32-plot community garden at 55th Street and Ames, and we'll be adding some more plots. And uh, we have been developing and growing in partnership with Tri-Faith uh, uh, Community Garden and others who want to help out. And then we started the Claire Cares Food Pantry, which operates on the third Saturday of every month, where now we are reaching between 220 to 285 uh, families every month. And we try to make sure that our boxes contain at least 10 to 12 meals uh, for that month. We are a resource partner with the Food Bank of the Heartland. Uh, we have partnership with First United Methodist, First Unitarian uh, Church, and others, uh, and just entered a partnership with Baker Stores. The Dillon, Dillon's is their uh, home company in Hutchinson, Kansas, that now will be buying from them in bulk. So uh, we're spending uh, at least about $2,000, $2,500 uh, a month to make sure that we have um, boxes available for people along with uh, meat. And then we're also doing the USDA uh, produce box distribution. We started that in June and we do that on Fridays. And so it's been one that we are addressing uh, the issues because the church is the place where people look to, uh, to receive. So I'm just happy to be able to serve uh, this long uh, and the community of North Omaha. Thank you, Portia. And I have a vision that you are probably going to be getting a national award within the new, within the future for everything you're doing because you are like the Energizer Bunny. I don't know how you do it, but well, I know how you do it. You do it because you've got the love of God in your heart. But thank you so much. Our next panelist 
is uh, Jim Swanson, Swanee as he goes by, and I'll just ask him to introduce himself and welcome to the panel. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me tonight. And uh, Senator Wayne, thank you for being here with us tonight. Sister Cynthia, thank you for uh, inviting us all. So my name is Jim Swanson. I go by Swanee. Um, I am the Director of Student and Family Support at the Q's school system in North and East Omaha. Our school system involves three schools, Sacred Heart, Holy Name, and All Saints Catholic Elementary Schools. 92%, uh, well, about, not about 92, 93% of our students are students of color. Uh, a large percentage are recent immigrant families from Central America, from Africa. And now we've uh, had an influx recently of students from Burma, from Myanmar, uh, who families came from the refugee camps in Thailand. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to serve any student who wants an education. Uh, we do, we are a Catholic school. Um, we welcome all students to our schools. Uh, my role is to be the director of student family support. So um, we were trying to provide wraparound services for our families. Uh, we have found that in a small community such as ours with about 600, 550 students and maybe 290 families that uh, the trust that is built between the families and the teachers and the staff uh, and the whole community allows us to maybe support the families in a unique way. And so we partner with many uh, great organizations in North and East Omaha and we're so uh, fortunate and blessed to have these partners with us. Uh, the Heart Ministry Center, we work with very often. Um, I referred a family there today who needed some help uh, with utility bills. And uh, I'm fortunate to be able to speak some Spanish and this mother spoke Spanish. And so to be able to, and then I referred her to the Heart Ministry Center to a Spanish speaking uh, case manager who's able to help, hopefully we'll be able to help her with the utility bills. But the key to this, and I think we'll all agree with this, is that it's not about a Band-Aid. It's not about let's pay those bills, help with those bills. That's part of it. But that we want people to become, have the ability to become self-sufficient, to be able to um, make their own choices in life so that they can support their kids and their families. And Senator Wayne, you're exactly right. The economic uh, ability of our families to be able to support uh, housing, education, insurance, childcare, um, healthcare, all of those things that come into play for our families. And how can we help them find jobs to be able to support their family that are uh, uh, living wage? Um, so that's part of what my role is. And partnering with the Heart Ministry Center, Lutheran Family Services, um, Operation Hope, helping families understand their budget, bring down credit and debt. Uh, those are so crushing to human beings, the debt that they incur at times, sometimes on people praying on some of our families with, with a lack of English, uh, lack of cultural knowledge. Uh, there are times that we know that people take advantage of, of these opportunities and people make decisions that aren't so uh, helpful for their economic situation. Um, so I, I feel so fortunate to be able to be a part of the family's lives. And, my role is to walk with the families and to be in partnership with them, to learn from them as we go along and so that we can support them to be able to uh, get to where they wanna be. Uh, our ultimate goal is to help our students go on to high school and then uh, be empowered to move on to a, a training situation, a two-year college, a trade school, a four-year college, something. Our whole goal for them is to have a plan and don't just go through this, this whole educational process and then you graduate from high school and you, you go, you make your $10 an hour job um, someplace that probably is not gonna be able to support your family and the future that you want to see for yourself and your family. So uh, we've partnered with uh, Upward Bound down at Creighton University, and we've really been encouraging our families to look at that. Uh, we also partnered with the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the Omaha Public Schools at Omaha North and Omaha South. Uh, encouraging our families to look at the Nebraska College Preparatory Academy, uh, which is fantastic. Um, we really encourage our families to look at the uh, Omaha Bridges Out of Poverty and the Getting Ahead class. And we've had about 25 families take that class. 
uh, I have found it to be incredibly motivating um, for the families that I work with. Uh, so that's, th those are some of the families and the partners, some of the partners that we use for our families to be able to um, gain self-sufficiency and to move forward. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you everybody. And I look forward to some more conversation. Yes, thank you. I, you you've already mentioned some programs that I, I am not familiar with. So thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Our next, uh, our panelists, our last panelist is uh, Donna Polk. I'm very excited that she is here with us talking about really her experiences and focusing more on Native Americans. And one thing, Donna, I've been thinking about the last few days. Uh, I spent some time on Pine Ridge and people go there every year to, to retrim the trailers because they lose heat during the winter months, build bunk beds, build outhouses because Pine Ridge is, I think, the second most impoverished county in the United States. And I, I couldn't understand why they would burn all this stuff until I have family in Houston that has said they've, they've had to burn their their deck furniture to stay warm and we do what we need to do to survive and I know you've you've seen that firsthand as well so thank you for being with here tonight please introduce yourself and I don't know I know you're not gonna be able to capture everything you're involved in but if you could just highlight what's on your heart that would be great well thank you very much for this opportunity and I've given a lot of thought as to what I would say and one of the things I wanted to really emphasize is that I first came to Omaha, Nebraska in 1964. My late husband was in the military and he was assigned to a missile site in Louisville, Nebraska. And we, when we arrived in Omaha, it was a blizzard that they said was the worst since the 1940s. And we, he drove to Louisville to find us a house. And he was told that we couldn't live there because they didn't allow coloreds to live there. So when we then went to the Red Cross, they said that they could find us a place and it was in Pleasant View Housing, 2906 Patrick Avenue. And having been a military brat and then married into the military, I was used to living in public or military housing we had lived in the South, so I was used to living in a segregated community. But what astounds me today is that Omaha is still virtually very, very segregated. And there are code words that are used, North Omaha meaning the Black community and South Omaha now meaning people who speak Spanish and who are not indigenous, but come from many places. And I can remember in the 60s and 70s when you could walk the streets of South Omaha and not see a person of color. So it's really been a dramatic change, which I'm not opposed to change. But when I think about the people who are my constituents and who I descend from on my maternal side, I think we may, may acknowledge their existence and presence in this community, but that's about the extent of it. We don't try to integrate Native Americans into our workplaces, into our health facilities, into our churches. And it just is something that really bothers me. But, you know, I've just tried to focus on what it is that I can do. Because one of the things I've learned, much of the racism in this country emanated from the government. There was a vested interest in them maintaining certain classes of people. And I can't really change that. But I try to focus on working with people who can make change. And of course, I listened to uh, Senator uh, Wayne, and I'm very interested in 548. Very, very interested. Um, because I think it's fairly obvious that there are discrepancies. And because I am the mother of the only racial minority judge at the district court level in Nebraska in its history, and I, 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 I was very distraught when he sought to refer juveniles to juvenile court. And my own party that I dearly love, the Democrats, 
they had people turn against him who wanted him not to be retained because he did that. And I was so angry, my first thought was to post something on Facebook. But before I did that, I called him because I try to remember, you know, he has certain protocols or the way he lives his life that is not like his wild and crazy mother. But, you know, I was so distraught that he had done that. And what he told me was, mom, I was just trying to give him a chance because I knew if they went into the adult system, that would be the end of it for them in terms of them having a chance to turn their life around. And I could certainly relate to that because I volunteered in the Nebraska Department of Corrections for 26 years. And my volunteerism ended on the day that they executed Harold Ote because I had spent the whole day with him. And I walked out of that prison and I thought I'm through. I, I, I don't know what else I can do. And so I just wanted to say that, and to say that there is so much work to be done and so little time. My passion, of course, is health, because I don't care what job you have, I don't care what neighborhood you live in, what church you go to, if you don't have good health, you're just like everybody else. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has shown us what health disparities will do that's why people of color have died and suffered catastrophic air outcomes because of underlying health conditions. That only getting COVID really brought to the surface of how precarious their health really was. And we need, I'm doing everything I can to change it, but it's something that just weighs on me. And so with that, Oh, I do want to say, um, I am on the board of No More Empty Pots, and we do a lot of things regarding food security. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Donna. And I'm excited now because now we have not only uh, the panelists, but we're going to bring back State Senator Justin Wayne and have uh, open dialogue. And I'm looking at the chat questions. So again, if you're watching us, on Facebook Live, if you have questions. I do have a couple I have to go back and pick up. And so really this is for you, Senator Wayne. How, how do you get a judge to understand a circumstance? What is going on, community education, training? How, how does one present a full picture? And what's kind of a bonus here is not only are you a state senator, but you're also a lawyer with your own private practice. So you, you have, a perspective that really is so peripheral on these issues? Um, so if it's a felony, they do what's called a PSI. And that's a, uh, well, they go through your background, look at your, look at your family, look at your job opportunities, look at your social, social ability. Um, problem is that PSI, I think in the 15 years I've been a lawyer, I've never seen a PSI say probation. It's always straight sentence because the factors themselves are biased. For example, if you look at the family dynamics and you have a, somebody who's 22, uh, it's, awful, it's also oftentimes a generation, a cycle, it's generational, generational, generational. So you're automatically graded uh, low because somebody in your family may or may not have been to jail is typically how the system works. So it's a negative. Uh, so then you're already you know, behind it just because you were born in that setting doesn't make you a bad person, but that's how they, they grade you. Then they look at your education. And what's interesting about education is every time there's a discipline, it goes on your record and they use that in your sentencing. So there's multiple things that just start stacking up to give a picture of this individual as a, as a criminal who we should throw away the key. Your job as an attorney is to get to know that person uh, and tell a different story. Say, so you know what, yeah, mom might have might have had problems, but here's what he was doing, here's where he's at now. And what I always used to do, and I don't practice a lot of criminal law anymore because of my because I'm a senator. Uh, now just think about that. I don't want to walk in the courtroom and me and a judge or a judge and I feel like we have a competition uh, because 
I'm on judiciary, I used to be, and I can oversee a law or a bill to change what they do. And I don't want to add that dynamic anymore to my clients. I've, uh, in fact, I've had harder sentences and I had a judge tell me, well, I can't give you a break because I don't want people thinking I'm giving you a break. And I'm like, I don't want a break. I just want a fair shot. Um, so with that being said, your job is to tell the story in a different way. And oftentimes you can do that if a person is charged and they're out, which we talk about cash bail bonds and things like that. But if they're out, they get a job, they're working and they're doing all the things pr productive. Uh, by the time you go to a trial and go to sentencing, six, seven months have passed and you can present a judge a completely different story than when he first got, he or she got picked up. That, that's the key uh, is to make those arguments. But it also comes down to making those arguments with the prosecutor. At the end of the day, if you got a joint recommendation on a lighter sentence, nine times out of 10, the judge is going to follow it. But there again, when we talk about diversity, uh, not a whole lot of black and brown folks are in Don Klein's office. So uh, when you talk about struggles of poverty, uh, you have to look no farther than our judicial or juvenile system where uh, you get caught in the juvenile system. They want you to go out and get a two bedroom apartment, one for your kid and one for you. Uh, and I can tell you that how many people I know growing up had a single single bedroom apartment and they gave the kids the, the bed and, and they slept on the couch. That doesn't make them a bad parent, but you'll see a lot of people who can't get out of the juvenile system because of those barriers. And that goes back to affordable housing. See how we're connecting all the dots again. If you can't, if you can't rent a house for $1,100 or less and you got three kids and the state is telling you you have to have separate bedrooms or things like that, you're stuck in the juvenile system. So then if you happen to do something when you're older uh, and you're an adult, then they go back to your juvenile record and say, this person's always been in the system. It's just, it's a, it's a constant cycle that as the attorney, you have to go through each point and, and show why it's different. And that's, that's hard to do. Um, you can walk into a, a courtroom and uh, they read an order and you know, they wrote the order two days before, before they heard your argument. That's just the way it works. Um, so it's really important you 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 work with the prosecutors to figure out a, a deal if you're if you're going to plead out something like that. Otherwise, um, I, I, it's really hard to, to to tell a judge or sell a judge on on what that person is or who that person is. Okay, thank you. I have I have two more questions, and then I want to get some uh, inner dialogue between you and the panelists. One of the questions that had come up earlier is how can a, a person of color get a fair jury decision by an all white jury so that's part of this racial uh justice act that you know it's a dialogue right i mean you can't say because somebody was black uh on the jury panel they would have been not guilty like we just can't make that argument but if it's a 50 50 question about credibility particularly about a police officer your experience with those police officers you bring that to the jury you, you, as a juror, you bring your experiences into that jury room. And as much as we, as much as we tell the, and the judge will tell them, follow the strict letter of the law, do X, Y, and Z, you can't help but remove the, you can't remove the lens in which you lived. So you're like, you know, I, I don't know if I believe that cop. I, you know, maybe it wasn't that there are drugs in the glove compartment. Maybe it was truly the, the girl who had the car or the guy who had the car and he literally just got in to drive down to the gas station. Those credibility issues, which a lot of cases are really convicted on mm -hmm. from the witnesses, it, that does make a difference when you start talking about racial impact and economic impact and whether you believe or don't believe somebody. Um, I mean, it's, it's the life experiences you have. And that's uh, here in Nebraska, it's such a segregated state that experiences are going to definitely shift one's perception. I, I would say that there is not a criminal defense attorney, white, black, or other, who hasn't had a conversation with their client. I understand what you're saying, but we are going to walk into a jury room where 90% of the people are going to be white and it could be an all white jury. You have, I mean, you didn't do your service as, a, as, a, as an attorney if you don't have that conversation going into that, especially dealing with a young black male. Doesn't make it right, doesn't make it fair, but as an attorney, I have to explain the dynamics of us walking into a trial and what we're dealing with. 
That's just what it is. And this will be a good time. I do have another question, but I'll come back to it later because um, I want to bring in the panelists because the panelists are all involved in the community, whether it be education or in the church. How, as you members of the uh, panel, Portia, Swanee, Donna, how would you be able to help the people that you're in contact with every day, just prepare them to maybe if they are called on a jury to serve with a very open mind, open heart, and not from blinders based on, on racism. And I'll start with you, Swanee, since uh, you're, you're right there in the, the thick of the education with uh, our youngsters. Um, I would say that I don't have that conversation often with my, with my students um, or the parents, uh, probably because we're dealing with uh, getting schoolwork done and, uh, and the simple uh, paying bills and moving forward like that. Um, I know with, with all of the civil unrest this summer and all of the questions and the Black Lives Matter and all of the um, rising of understanding or working towards understanding and, and working towards one another, um, my role as a white man in a predominantly uh, black and Latino and uh, Asian school, um, I, I, it was hard for me. I, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that I, I loved them for who they were and who they are. And regardless of, of anything um, that is in their background, uh, their race, uh, their culture, um, so for me, it was a, it was a, a reckoning and a reminding, reminder to me to treat all people with the same inherent human dignity that, that I believe that we all possess. Um, and I hope that that carries on. And, and I think our, our staff and our faculty and our, our schools, our administrators, and certainly all the people that I, I work with in all the community organizations that we partner with, uh, I'm just so uh, impressed by their um, showing of love for all, all humanity. And that's, it's, 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 it, comes, it becomes very simple at that point. Um, I think that question of, of loving all human beings uh, regardless of anybody's situation, but um, I'm not really answering your question. I just wanted to say that. I just, I just that's it's an important uh, point for, for me. Um, and my hope is that our students find that and families see that and that it carries over into their lives as well uh, as they encounter people of all different walks of life in their lives that they work to treat people with that inherent human dignity that we all possess. Okay. Did that Thank answer you. your question? I don't know. Well, no, I mean, there's not a really question. And Don, I was thinking of you and uh, not to put you on the spot and divulge anything that your son probably has shared with you, but how do you approach that question of, of educating anyone who could be pulled into a jury to, to really awaken themselves and understand that the, the injustice that's in our, our judicial system? Well, let me say this. One of the benefits I think I have is that I had one year in a segregated school, and that was a freshman year at the HBCU. And because of that, my whole outlook on life is maybe very different because I think it's not what you know, it's who you know. And you cannot tell me that if you have lived your life in a certain way, if you end up in a courtroom, and you know the son of the judge or the daughter of the judge, or you know the, the, the prosecuting attorney, you're not gonna be treated differently. But it's just like we talked earlier about people. You know, I, I grew up with a grandmother who was, was, was half native, who said things that I didn't even understand until maybe as an adult. Like you lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. You know, apple don't fall for far from the tree. There were all kinds of things that she said that now I get it. 
And so what I tried to do as the CEO of Nebraska Urban Indian Health, and even as a volunteer when I was living in Lincoln, is to try to talk to young people and tell them, look, you've got to do something different because if you don't, this is what you're going to be confronted with. The other thing that I did was to make sure that my staff as therapists went to court with any of their clients. Because I found when I was doing volunteer work at York that a lot of those women had gone to prison thinking, they, I mean, gone to court thinking they were even going to get probation. Mm -hmm. And they dropped their kids off at a babysitter and ended up in York, Nebraska, where there is no public transportation. People can't hardly get there to see their relatives. You see what I'm saying? And so that's basically, in a nutshell, some of the things that I've done to try to confront the prison industrial complex. Because that's what it is. It's about business. They don't care about the people that they throw away in there. They don't care. It's about money. It's about developing jobs in rural communities. And that. Uh, we have a question actually that would be good for that, but I want to get Portia's insights on just preparing youth for uh, a biased jury or how to educate people to serve on juries. And, and I'm hoping and I'm going to speak at it uh, maybe from a different angle, but my thing is I try to remind young people and I failed to say that we've adopted uh, three schools in our neighborhood, Mount View Elementary, Wakanda Elementary, and Nathan Hale uh, Magnet Middle School. And so I try to encourage young people to be their best self. But then on the flip side of that, uh, I try to educate uh, those persons that come across my path white, black, or otherwise, that they would have an open mind. We all have our own implicit biases and looking at the system and the way uh, it's set up now, we want to tell families how they ought to raise their children or how they ought to be in this quote unquote uh, family system. And we don't understand or even try to listen uh, to get to know that person's struggle. Most of the time we hear children, they're frustrated, they're upset and says that you're not listening, you don't understand. We've got to take time out to understand and not judge that child just because they might not be clean that day or uh, their clothes might be a little worn or tight or old, or they might have been hanging out with the wrong crowd, does not mean that every child is that way. And so we have to encourage our uh, young people to make the right decisions. Uh, yes, we have to teach them and tell them uh, to look at how they choose their friends. And when you're getting in trouble or someone else is getting in trouble, is someone just judging you based on what you're doing or who you're hanging out with? It's, it's a whole lot that we have to begin to do. And so for those uh, who cross my path along the way, I try to help them uh, to look through a different lens. I try to appeal to their consciousness uh, so not only am I trying to tell young people if they have to go before the court, I'm also uh, sharing with people that I come in contact with for them to check themselves and their own implicit bias and have a conscious and listen to the person, try to put themselves in that person's shoes. Thank you very much. And I, I know earlier, Senator Wayne said that it's all connected. And one of the aspects you talked about with the uh, re-urban development I was wondering about the tax increment funding. How come North Omaha doesn't get that? And I don't know if you can tie this in, but as Donna brought up the prison industrial complex, how come all this money is going to a new juvenile detention center when it could go into really helping our youth? And maybe if you could talk about those two and then definitely want input on the panelists as well. So as chair of Urban Affairs Committee in, in the legislature, I, I actually oversee the, the, the tax, increment, tax increment financing laws. And so 2017, we did a, a major overhaul of tax increment financing. And what we did is we looked across the state uh, to see what changes we can make. But in that study and in that argument of getting that bill passed, um, 
what I really found out is why would somebody go to North Omaha when they can go to Crossroads and get the same benefit? Mm. So tax increment financing basically says you have a, if you're paying a hundred dollars now and you do construction on your project and you increase the value, so say by another hundred, let's keep the math simple. Then that gap from your original hundred to your 200, that extra hundred, you can go to a bank and get a loan on over 15 years period. That's, that's what tax increment financing is. That's really the only tool that the city has to do development. There's, there's some other things they can grant and stuff like that, but a real tool is that. Well, if the city continues to blight 108th and Dodge or 168th and, and West Maple Road uh, for developers so they can get that same tool. So if I'm a developer, which I'm not yet, one day I hope to be, but not yet, but if I'm a developer, why would I go to North Omaha when the basic tool that I'm gonna get, the same financing, I can get out west. Although there's more risk in North, North Omaha, it is what it is. There's more risk in North Omaha. So what we did is we we ch we changed uh, some language, and actually last election, the state of Nebraska approved what's called extremely blighted. And so I have a bill LB twenty five right now that is on select file for the implementation of extremely blighted, and what that'll do is is give North Omaha, and they're designated by a different set of rules. It's 200% uh, the average unemployment rate and 20% poverty. You kind of see a theme of how I'm targeting North Omaha with those two factors, um, but it's North and South Omaha. There's a couple places across the, the rest of the state who have it too, but uh, you get to extend that 15, 15 year loan to a 20 year loan. Now, what that does is that makes your payment a little smaller, and now you can cash flow this a little better from a construction standpoint. So my goal is, uh, again, it, the city of Omaha decided they were going to start tiffing stuff, which I think is in, improper, but on 190th and Dodge. To me, that's not blighted. It just isn't. Um, so that's how we try to deal with that to create more affordable housing, more more development in North Omaha, and the and the voters actually approved it. Uh, and so now I have the implementation bill LB25 that we're going to pass to to allow the city of Omaha to do it. I also passed along to that of affordable housing. Uh, one thing about North Omaha and black people in general is in slavery, the, we owned 1% of real property. Across the country today, we still only own 1%. Now, I just can't believe it's because black people don't have jobs. It goes back to that systemic, systematic, and institutional racism. They're all different, supposedly, but they all have the same outcome to me. Uh, so what we did is we, during this, the city approved this extremely blighted area. And so people, first time homeowners in North and South Omaha can qualify for a $5,000 tax credit over the next six years. I, I got that approved last year. We also got approved for North Omaha and South Omaha, $8 million in a grant by the state to do affordable housing. That's how all that's connected. When we talk about the juvenile system downtown, that's unfortunately a county issue that as much as I'm against it, our county board uh, did it. There's nothing I, I can do about it. I'm, I'm against it. I've always been against it. Um, we need to put more into services, but services require work. And what people are starting to realize is programs don't change people. People change people. You got to sit down and get that one-on-one, -on -one, which is why if, if Pastor uh, Portia decides she's running for office, I'm in big trouble because she's in my district because she, she is out there changing people daily uh, with food, with help, because it isn't the program, it's the people. And that requires work. And when you start hiring high quality people, that costs money. And we would rather build prisons and juvenile detention centers than actually put money in the people to change people. It's easier. It's cost efficient is what they always say, but it doesn't change the dynamics of what's going on in our, our economy and what's going on in North Omaha. Can I Thank just you. add it's something right. too that I want to say about taking action? We hear a lot of talk about affordable housing. Well, one of the things I was able to do because I had this vision of being able to provide housing and I also had a, an option because the developer was really after my existing property was to find a location where we could build uh, affordable apartments. And we did get TIF money, development, we got all, all kind of money <laughs> um, because it was an investment. 
So we built 44 affordable housing units in South Omaha on 23rd and N Street because we've had a presence in South Omaha in the past. And it's just really important that people understand that the whole eviction fiasco that's confronting people who are poor um, is going to come crashing in on us. But I thought it was important to provide services. So we were very fortunate to have a 26,000 square foot building directly across the street from the apartment location. But raising the money to renovate that and to provide staffing is another challenge because we are seeking money from foundations. One foundation has been very, very, very generous, but we still have to raise that money because it isn't fair to have affordable housing and tell people they got to catch a bus or a jitney and go across town to get the services that should be right there where they are. So Donna, I have a question. So HUD did not help you out with that at all? Well, kind of. <laughs> well, with the apartments? Right. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, even the state helped us, you know, with the grant. The city, you know, people really reached out because like I said, you know, like the Senator said, it's like a 15 year experience. People know they're, if they invest, they're gonna get their money back. NIFA helped us, you know, we had all kind of partners and I certainly didn't know what I was doing other than signing a lot of legal documents. <laughs> but now it's full, we have a waiting list. And another thing, somebody mentioned earlier about relationships with law enforcement. I meet with. You hit your mute button. Well, we'll, uh oh, we'll ask her to unmute here. Well, that's okay. okay. That's a good way of shutting me up. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, we, we, we didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't do that. I promise we did not do that. Um, I do want to go back to Senator Wayne talked about how he doesn't have really jurisdiction over the juvenile detention center. That's a city council. And I just want to ask Pastor P about how much she's been involved at city council and talking to them because every single one of us will pre COVID can go to city council and be heard. And I think that's a very powerful way for everyone to have a voice. So uh, Pastor P, could you just talk a little bit about what you did with city council? And okay. Well, first of all, it was not city council. It was Douglas County. Okay. Thank <laughs> yes, you. I went to Douglas County, uh, sat through the board of equalization and then for the Douglas County, uh, because I wanted to understand uh, the juvenile detention center, because you were hearing uh, different things. The uh, facility that we have now is like a little prison and what they're going to build and to have greenery or all of those different things. But when I went to talk to them, I want to know about the programs. You're talking about building a facility where it would be somewhat of a one-stop shop where the attorneys, the different programs that people can go to. But there's still this little, um, um, I don't know if it's a, a good boys club or whatever, uh, but they're not utilizing all programs that are offered in the community. And even those programs uh, that are run by African-American or people of color, they're not sending our kids to those programs, but they're sending their kids to those programs. And when I talk about those programs, uh, here in North Omaha, I'm talking about Mays, Metro Area um, uh, Youth Services. Now they're up at the old uh, St. Paul Lutheran uh, Church building. You've got Reconnect. You've got different day reporting services. You've got different services where there are people of color working, but then you got Operation Youth Success and different things that are going on, but how are they really helping families and starting in the schools before kids get uh, to be system involved? We've got to begin early and uh, working on and helping families 
Uh, we all know what we've done with our children, with our own children in our household. They didn't like some of the disciplines that we gave them, or even you didn't hear from me the little love taps that you had to uh, set uh, in place. But if we don't advocate for and hold everyone accountable and make sure that they are helping children early on before they reach the juvenile detention center, so that's what I'm trying to help. Uh, Douglas County Health Dep um, Douglas County uh, uh, Board of uh, Commissioners to understand and City Council. If I have to go, I do go and talk to them often about various things that I don't agree with. No, thank you because I think you are a great role model as to how those of us who aren't elected officials can get involved and really sway uh, decisions that are made more with the community. Uh, at interest than the corporations at interest. We had a question a way back that I want to come back to. So Senator Wayne, the question is, does the prosecutor's office charge the same crimes in the same way for North and West Omaha? Who decides the sentences? Are they usually suggested by the prosecution or strictly by the judge? And that's in the chat room because that's a three-pronged uh, question there. The short answer is uh, North Omaha is about 30% uh, higher police than anywhere else in the city. Uh, as far as charges, there's two two lines of defenses. First is the, is the cop. The police officer can choose to give you a ticket or choose not to. Uh, they have that choice and they do it all the time. They exercise that choice all the time. And then the second point of our line of defense would be the prosecutor. The prosecutor can choose to prosecute or choose not to prosecute, which uh, they do all the time. Uh, the problem is we don't have a very good juvenile uh, di diversion program. We don't have services. Uh, we just continue to do the same thing. And the, and, the, and the real reason is we as a community continue to allow people outside of our community to do things for us. Um, and that's been the biggest problem that I, I've seen is one of its economics, like, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to ask foundations if we have enough money throughout our community with businesses uh, to build our own. That, that's a big problem uh, that we're trying to address. But the reality is, is uh, foundations run a lot of our services and they dictate what you can and can't do, what bill you can and can't speak on. Um, and that's, that's scary. So we have to figure out how to make sure um, if they give us money, we still we have a wall on which we can operate. And if they can't trust us, then they don't need to give us money. But that's hard to say when you're making a living and you're serving 400 kids, you don't want your program to shut down either. So there's multiple things in there I just said, but at the end of the day, um, the prosecutor and the police maker can choose to prosecute or choose not to prosecute. Okay, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left. And what I'd like to do is offer for the panelists to each ask a question of Senator Wayne. So Donna, I will uh, begin with you if you have a question or if you wanna pass and think about it, maybe uh, Swanee or Portia have a question ready to go for Senator Wayne. Well, for Senator Wayne, I would just like for you, if you can have your staff contact us or me if there are issues related to the Native community that we might support you and Senator Brewer on. The needs are so great. And so we don't, and it's more than missing and murdered women and others. So I offer that to you. Thank you. And thank you so much for the work that you do. I appreciate it. Thank you. So what, what people don't know is her son was one of my mentors. Uh, uh, I used to play pickup basketball games with him up at uh, Omaha Home for Boys. And uh, when he was in private practice, he was one of the attorneys I always talked to. Uh, so that that's that's how we also make change. All right, I'll uh, ask Swanee, what question would you like to ask? Senator well, I, I, wanted, I would ask Senator Wayne to uh, repeat those uh, percentages about, you said that the state of Nebraska is second in one area, oh, okay. in another area, and yet 48th in equality between those. What, what were the- 
So what they are is the USA Today, they always do rankings on states. And so uh, if you look at, we're always in the top 10 for affordability. And right now we're ranked number six. We have affordable place to live. Economic opportunity, we're always in the top half and we're currently ranked 18th. But within those top two, they have this factor called equality and they look at different things like education, prison gaps, all these gaps within that affordability and eco, uh, economic, economic opportunity. And we're ranked 48th. Um, and that's the glaring statistic that, uh, that I think we need to change. And the equality within, within racial. Right, so the, I'll give you the quick factors are men to women in labor force, uh, gaps in me medium income for both men, women, racial, uh, differences between people with disability and those without as far as some of the gaps, gaps in educational achievement, uh, income, employment for ha Hispanics, non-Hispanics, racial divide. I mean, all the, any kind of disparity you can see that would affect housing, uh, the ability to for afford housing and the ability to have a good job. So there's about eight factors and we rank 48th in that, op in that part. Wow. And I, and I remember maybe 10 years ago, we were ranked, um, that 60% of our black children lived in poverty yes. um, in Omaha. We, we are um, always in the top five in poverty for African-American children in, this, in the country. Right, which is, which is embarrassing for our community uh, and awful for our children uh, and our families. And um, so, so thank you for your work. My one other quick question was, you mentioned that they, uh, that the city puts a blighted um, phrase on the areas, some of the areas way out west. How do they manage to do that when the areas probably aren't blighted? As you the, the courts have interpreted the substantial, sub, uh, substandard and blighted law to mean one out of about fourteen factors. So all you got to do is have one. Uh, so uh, it's easy. It's easy to blight anything. And so if you remember TD Ameritrade going up on 108th and Dodge the city actually blighted that after it was about halfway built so they can get additional funds to, to do that. Wow. If we don't see corruption uh, in the mist and we are listening uh, today, I'm sorry, Cynthia, I didn't even wait for you to ask me. <laughs> That's fine. I'm sorry. But I mean, you know, it's to the point that as a, a prophet, priest, and pastor, I have to speak truth to power. And so in uh, the mess, we do a good talk of recognizing that African-American or Blacks are living in poverty, but we still have not addressed it. We'll help everyone else, but we still have not addressed the race that is uh, within our community have been with us all of the years, as long as Nebraska has been a state. We even heard uh, for the indigenous population, as well as for African-Americans, whether they were slaves at that time or not, they have been here on this land in this state, and we still have not done what we need to do. So uh, Senator Wayne, for me, I uh, wrote down when you were talking about LB5, 48, the Nebraska Racial Justice uh, Act, uh, you got to start somewhere. I know that you say that um, it's a process uh, or you're trying to figure out how to uh, present it, but we've got to start somewhere. We've got to begin to have the conversation. And in light of everything that has happened around uh, the United States and even the world, uh, now might be the right time. To, to deal with the racial issue. We have to confront racism head on. And people know that they have been racist. People, people know that they have uh, kept their feet on the necks of African-American, whether they are young, old. Uh, even when I look at the vaccine rollout, in Nebraska, and you look at the numbers and how many Caucasians have gotten the shot, you can't tell me all of them are healthcare providers. I don't care how you look at it. And for uh, 
minorities, people of color, is less than 5%. You can't keep putting the same little statement uh, about the Tuskegee experiment, because who brought that up? Was it the medical or health um, entities that bringing that up? We have to make sure that it is available for everyone. Our health disparities are going to go out the roof because now we're still at 70 uh, and up to get the vaccine. But when I look at the numbers of a hundred and something thousand having been vaccinated and 77% are Caucasian, we've got to deal with the race issue in Nebraska. Agreed. And I just want to say, Pastor P, that thank God for the Indian Health Service, because I was just informed today that I will have vaccine <laughs> so I can stop asking white people to please help us because they have turned their back on us, except for Noah and bless their hearts up there. We will have our vaccine and we can vaccinate people who again are left behind, right. left behind. And so you're you're getting that from a dhs no i'm getting it from the indian health service okay so from there and so we got to address this issue we we can't keep playing this game and saying that um the health disparities and people of color are dying when we're not addressing it now we can save lives right. and we need to be doing it now so everyone who's had the shot what black person or person of color do you know that's had the shot also? All right. Well, we are coming close to the end before I turn it back over to Sister Cynthia, and I will leave it to Senator Wayne for any last closing thoughts. Thank you, panelists. All three of you are amazing, inspire me, and I'm grateful for your activism in our community. So Senator Wayne, any closing thoughts? Just uh, stay active. Those who are watching, uh, contact your local officials, but stay active. Um, you know, sometimes it gets hard, sometimes it gets frustrating, but you got to stay active. And success is just, is, is taking a step forward. It, it ain't always the big leap you always want, but we just got to keep taking steps forward. No, thank you very much. And the long view of legislation. I think many of us just want things to happen overnight, but um, thank you for getting the process started, even though it seems like it's been ongoing. And again, thank you to our panelists and uh, those watching, please continue to stay engaged and you can uh, go to the Facebook page. You'll see a recording of this and Sister Cynthia will be able to get in, you in contact with any of our panelists or Senator Wayne if you have any further questions. So Sister Cynthia, uh, I will turn everything back over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm unmuted, so let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, my final, my concluding comments just include a huge thank you to everyone. I've been trying to listen, learn, and respond. And that clear vision that Preston Love Jr. speaks of in his book, I need to pick up his little book again. Um, I think um, I would just want to announce that our next program, uh, whoops, I went a little bit too far there. Um, our next Expand Your Horizons, we're skipping March due to a lot of activity and responsibility here in our community. April 15th, it will be Care of the Earth. So again, we will be listening for the wisdom of our Native American peoples, as well as whatever Nebraskans for Peace can bring forward as we face our um, responsibility to care for our Earth. So my acknowledgments again, I thank Pastor Cynthia for her um, guidance through this and I wrote down the word tapestry threads. So the tapestry tonight was pictured with many colors for me. And I see many threads hanging on the ends. And I think that um, someone I know who's been watching for questions from you, Deborah Mabry Strong, I thank you for being active with me and organizing our Expand Your Horizons. And for our panelists, I want to say I came up with three words, culture, education, and faith. So I see Donna is representing a culture that needs more attention in Nebraska. 
uh, Jim, with your education focus for families. Thank you for working on the ground in that system. And to any public school um, workers listening, I thank you for your work with education. Um, the faith Porsche, Porsche, thank you for representing that passion that God has given you. And anyone who doesn't know her many works, I can see why Pastor Cynthia said she's going to get an award. Her website is um, its very interesting to find out how many things you're involved in, Portia. Um, let's see, one, two, I've got everyone now. And I also wanna thank Ajmal Biden and Cynthia from October because they, they are the ones that helped move this one forward into this kind of conversation. So we're going to keep trying to have honest conversations, honest talk, as well as moving into the actions. Again, thank you. And thank you to our attendees help others get to see this program by sending them to the Facebook. Is Molly nearby? Molly? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Molly will speak to an event that's coming up. So I just wanted to mention quickly that uh, uh, the, our next big event for the Notre Dame Sisters is the Celebration of Spirit and you can uh, join the event on Facebook which is an event up there now, or uh, just make sure that you are joined to our mailing list, which you can do on our website, notredamesisters.org. Um, and just be ready for March 21st for the live event here on Facebook, similar to this one. This will be our main celebration of the year. But starting March 12th, you can start bidding on our auction items, which is really fun because we have lots of homemade gifts made by the Notre Dame Sisters. So things that are knitted, printed, written, um, all sorts of incredible things. So starting March 12th, you'll see it on Facebook. Um, that's when our auction opens. And of course, all of the proceeds go to the ministries and the retirement fund of the Notre Dame Sisters. So thank you for letting me talk about that, Sister Cynthia. Our final slide here is indicating if you wish to join our mailing list, Molly's the one to send in information to. And with that, I just praise God for each one of you and for the faith that has helped all of us to move forward in our own lives and our personal journeys. And I guess it's appropriate on this cold week we have. God bless you, stay warm and safe. And may all who don't have that be blessed with someone bringing that presence of warmth to them. Good night, everyone. <laughs>